Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name's E Fong, and with me is my co host, Lily. Hello, Lily. Hey, what's going on? Hello, hello. And today we're uh, on the Watching Silent Films. We pick a movie and we kind of talk about it. And so it'll just be Lily and I today. You might hear Bob. If you do, you'll kind of, we're going to record at different times. So we'll just kind of time shift like DVR, <laughs> Cause, which didn't exist in the uh, silent film days, but it, it sort of did in modern times. Well, that's gone by the wayside too. <laughs> Everything's all technology. <clears throat> um, today, we're going to talk about Every Woman's Problem, 1921, which is kind of a recut edition of Mothers and Men from 1917. And uh, before we get to that, uh, you didn't wa- you didn't happen to watch anything classic recently, right? Right, Lily? No, I yeah. still have to. I mean, my, I know I mentioned Breathless last week, but I still have not gotten. A- chance to watch it but i need to watch it so i will probably have a chance to talk about it next week because <laughs> might... i really need to watch it <laughs> i think that could be if you haven't searched for it, it's on canopy is that yeah i found it today? on canopy okay, perfect. 1960 yep john legadar is another whole nother thing <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> i have a lot I'm... of thoughts about him <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm gonna be working on a sh- uh, a film project within the next couple months so my director's like guys go check this movie out french film noir he loves it he loves all the crazy uh jump cuts he uses and just where he cuts um some of the scenes you know in weird ways so he's like right. just we're gonna try to do this and just watch it <laughs> i was like okay cool <laughs> and keep in mind that alice keeper did it in like 1890 something so mm-hmm. give that throw that back at him saying oh you've seen this you know alice keeper yeah <laughs> that is true you know, it's like that. I think I even mentioned that um, when we were going over Alex uh, uh shorts and stuff and movies. And I said, you know, it predates the French New Wave by like 60 plus years. <laughs> so take that, John Le or mm. whoever likes this stuff. Throw it back at him, you know. I'm actually glad you reminded me about that, too, because right before the podcast, I was working with our director of photography, and she mentioned that his birthday is tomorrow. So he's not really a big celebrator, but he's, he loves movies. So maybe I will be like, hey, Cam, happy birthday. Uh, check out Be Natural by Alice Gable or featuring <laughs> Alice Gable And he'll be like, oh. <laughs> so great. even if he hates his birthday, he can enjoy a film at least. <laughs> sure. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> So moving on to the feature that we're going to talk about um, it is called Every Woman's Problem. Uh, I don't know why they renamed it. I don't think I ever got a good reason, but I'll just read the description uh, of the movie. Um, and this is uh, some background. This is a uh, so San Francisco uh, Silent Film Festival takes place every year, I think in the spring sometime, April, May-ish, some, mm-hmm. some, sometime around there. I I don't think I've ever been to a silent film fe- film festival. I wish you know one was near in Boston. Maybe they do, and you know I just haven't heard about it. And if that's the case, let me know. You can always send a, an email to me at uh, watching silent films plural at gmail dot com if you've heard of anything like that near Boston area. I will surely go. But I've seen um you know onesies and twosies on and off, not as part of a festival uh, when they do revivals and stuff like that. But um anyways. So, and I wish I, you know, had the budget, time, money, wherewithal to travel to all these different silent film festivals all over the world. But uh, San Francisco is certainly one of the biggest. And because at the time of this recording in, uh, you know, April of 2020, we're in the middle of sort of the pandemic lockdown. Everybody's uh, staying home. And uh, if you're listening to this years from now, you kind of be laughing. <laughs> I remember those days. But we're in the midst of that, and as a result of that, this film festival, like in many other, you know, uh, entertainment and or activities outdoors, they're canceled. So, uh, but in spite of that, they still deliver this online, which I thought was cool. Like, I wish they just did it anyways. You know what I mean? Like, mm. regardless of pandemic, like I, I would not have access to this movie, and that's why it kind of. Last week, I was just like, this is great. Once I heard about it, I was just like, we got to just take advantage of the situation because I don't know when they're going to take it down because there's always some sort of copyright issues whenever they do this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm so glad that uh, and thanks to uh, San Francisco Silent Film Festival and all of the restoration and copyright and it, everybody who does the paperwork and all this stuff, <laughs> just thank them for posting that online and, and make it available online for streaming 
for free i just think that is amazing even for like a minimal cost like you know even for like 20 10 20 dollars or something you make a donation out to their foundation for restoration efforts and stuff like that yeah uh, i think that would be really cool i think they have a membership too i don't know how that ties in with whether with whether or not you can stream silent movies and stuff but in general this whole sort of pandemic has shifted the way even pe- people are watching movies and participating in fest- fest- film festivals you know they're shifting things into a little more online versions instead of like you physically go into a film festival and sort of watch a bunch of stuff you know so anyways um that's the background f- for sort of getting access to this movie and uh, i'll post a link to this movie and link it to sound film uh san francisco sound film um website and uh so that you know hopefully by the time this is finally published it'll still be around and people can still watch it maybe um but i'll just read off the description from the website uh, about this movie a melodrama at its finest penned by hal reed who knew his way around the art of crafting a melodrama brings us mothers and men topical for 1917 when women were bat- battling to obtain the right to vote Mothers of Men enters into the discussion and brings a provocative voice to the suffrage movement, showing the nation how strong women can be if allowed to hold political office. Dorothy Davenport, as Clara Madison, a prominent lawyer, wins a judgment, judgeship over fellow attorney Grant Williams, played by Willis L. Robards. Upon winning the prominent position as judge, uh, Ms. Madison finds herself walking a political tightrope with enemies all around, doing what they can do uh, what they can to cause her downfall. Judge Madison convicts a murderer to death, paving the way for her to be easily elected as the first female governor. As governor, she is faced with difficult, a difficult dilemma. She has the power to pardon her husband who has been convicted of a serious crime, but to do so, she'd be using her office for her own personal gains. I must find some way to realize my ideals without sacrificing my husband. I must struggle on somehow for the sake of womanhood. That's kind of the short summary for um, this particular movie. It's about roughly an hour, right? You think? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. What... When it first started, too, uh, did you did it happen on your end where it was just a uh, oh, like the radio uh, emergency signal came on? Oh no, that's I the was, color I, bars. That's kind of yeah. just um, it might they posted this on Vimeo. And a lot of Vimeo stuff has that stuff in the beginning, so that's more Vimeo the platform. Oh, okay. And not because I got the, nervous at first. I was thinking, uh, is this not going to work? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's just the way that um, they're kind of resetting, just testing everything, all the uh, audiovisual stuff. That's just part of how they deliver this. But that aside, they did talk about a little bit about the restoration and how the original element of this for the Mothers of Men, Men uh, title 1917 is all gone. And I think they recut this mm-hmm. in 1921. So it's definitely been re-edit it any uh first impressions definitely uh i well i like the musical score that they used for it and the other thing i noticed right away was just i love the intertitle cards they were all hand drawn and i don't know i liked how the intertitle cards when they were writing everything down it was with like it was kind of cursive so it reminded me of a feminine touch since really this is about is this a woman's story, even though it's about husband and wife? So I really liked that I- uh, idea and design for them. And I kind of thought it added a little bit more to the story, where before, you know, it's kind of, you know, the intertitle cards are there to give you the context and tell you about, you know, what's going on. But it just seemed more, I don't know, it just seemed more personal that way. I don't know, maybe because I'm a girl, but I was like, "Ooh, that looks really nice." <laughs> yeah, I, what I was, what I don't know for sure, and I had to read the initial introduction several times. It is it had been re-edited and retitled um, by somebody, and I didn't get any details. Now there weren't a lot of details online that I could fine on this specific movie or maybe i wasn't googling enough deep enough into the internet but um i didn't understand whether or not these titles were original from 1921 or um 
somebody you know from when they did the restoration in 2016 uh did it from scratch if that makes sense or yeah maybe they took the original film element and like used modern technology to create nice graphics for it mm, that makes i mean sense. it looks yeah. like you know pristine like it looks yeah you know, but the whole entire technical quality the video the film restoration is super clear there's you know there are some film distortions i would say if you yeah but it was it was beautiful i, I was, know i know it's always a restoration when you rewatch it now but i was like wow <laughs> i was just impressed to even see it that clearly but that's what i mean is like most of the restorations that we've seen like the one we just saw with thousand of course is a little bit older but still like you know it's a lot of blotches and unsteady and even like i think last week we had this uh sort of the the, the what is it the 12 year old girl trying to rescue a blind guy like huge like you know 20 percent of the film was you could see it was burnt up or like yeah. rotted <laughs> or something mm-hmm. they just like well that's the best we can do but here's the movie anyways <laughs> you can guess what happened yeah, in true. that frame <laughs> <laughs> and and so you know compare that to this it's like a brand new movie almost it's like yeah from, and what's gr- brilliant about it is like it, it's so clean pristine and uh, it and you can tell a good restoration when it's like n- not sort of you know jiggling around the frame itself. It's steady. Um, it's not just jumping all over the place. And so that's like, and it's clean and and so that's what that's what I was wondering. I didn't get that detail from anywhere, so I I wasn't sure if they redid the title cards in 2016 or they just like cleaned the print so well. That it just looks like it's it was just done recently, you know. Mm. So I'm not entirely sure, but either way, it looks amazing. The, all of the title cards, and I, I don't, I don't know if this is unique to this movie, but I don't think I've ever seen title cards where they ch- fade it, fade into a different graphic, like the 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 artwork. Yeah, definitely not so it, not that I've seen. Yeah, so it's like a dialogue line, or maybe it's telling uh, exposition of the story. And it would be like some artwork in the back. Well, it you know, as you're reading it, the artwork actually changes, almost like a screen there changes into something else. And that was pretty unique. So mm. again, I not sure if they did it in twenty sixteen restoration or it was part of the original film print. If it was the original, then it's just it's still pretty amazing, regardless. <laughs> so. Yeah, because it they you could I was well. I mean, what do I know? I don't. I'm not really an artist, but I don't know. Just looking at the, it was kind of like an old fashioned detail that they had put into those paintings for the intertitle cards. So I feel like it might actually be that old. Maybe the colors aren't correct now, but I. It, I don't know. It's just something about the way it was styled and painted. But it could like, be aged to look that way with computer graphics. That's it's that's true. Really too. hard to. That's why I was like I. I'm going to try to guess that it was. See, it, it's so hard to tell because, at least for me, is because uh, film elements get lost all the time. And uh, right. maybe, like, that particular element was gone, so they had to, like, rebuild everything from scratch because they had the physical script. I don't know. I'm just guessing. <laughs> what I was thinking, too, like, if we really wanted to know uh, – there, they had the email we could send them info yes. at silentfilm.com. Sure. <laughs> it's like, hey, is this re- real? Is this legit? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I didn't get to that part, but yeah, that's totally is something you could do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think you know, I think I'm gonna definitely do that for next week too, just because sure. I mean they're offering it, so I'm sure they're gonna be more than thrilled. Because, you know, especially since we're like, hey, Silent Film Podcast, we'd love to know. So we can <laughs> yeah. tell our viewers. They're going to be like, oh, you have a podcast? Whoa. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's probably the only active one on the internet, I'd say, at the current time. And so, well, All cool. Right. Uh, how about the actual themes of the movie and uh, what do you think about the whole uh, portrayal of just the whole thing, the whole story and how it was acted? And uh, Acting was really good. Uh, there were some like elements that were a little over expressive, like uh. Well, it was a melodrama. Yeah, a, very melodrama. So, <laughs> which is very it happens a lot in 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 the silent film era. It, not all of them, but a, a big chunk of them. Uh, 
tends to veer that way, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, the overall theme, I, I liked how they actually went with this woman becoming, you know, so powerful, but still portrayed it as her as just still so weak when it comes to the law and that she can't help her husband out because he gets framed for murder and you know fighting with the public in a sense you know fighting against the newspaper uh slandering her because she's a woman and with a powerful title but uh i still like that her husband supported her regardless so that was a that was something um, I was pleased to see. I don't know. I just feel with all the older films, and depending on, I guess, who's directing them, you know, we always think uh, the man's going to be higher than the woman. Well, at this one, the, you know, they're equal. And even uh, just thinking back to last week's when we were watching the rest of Alice Guy Blachey's films, uh, what was the one that where the the men were playing the women's roles and the women were playing the men's roles? Yeah, that's that like called? a role reversal essentially. Yeah, where, I wrote uh... down the consequences of feminism. Exactly. Just thinking about that, uh, you know. But the way Alice Guy portrayed it as you know, men and women are still equal, and for this play, this play, <laughs> for this film, it was kind of like that too, at least to me, where. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. I would say it was a little bit reversed too, in the way that uh, the guy is kind of in a in a, what could be construed as a typical female role of sort mm-hmm. of like, <clears throat> you know, like, you know, like, you know, woe is me, and you know, getting all this the problem. It, like, it's almost like if it was the man rising up, you know, as a judge and all that stuff, you know. It, it would he would still be dealing with the same sort of moral issues except that you know a lot of people wouldn't be talking about sort of the male female roles as much right yep but just the virtue of switching sexes of like you know the husband now is sort of in the the female what could what very commonly is a, a female role in those these type of movies i mean just the fact that it's a 1917 1920 movie was like amazing if you think about mm-hmm. it like even today it's still very rare to see movies that tackle these types of topics yeah on like a lot of well, film companies don't even green light these type of movies you know they're like i don't want to deal with this <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what they i mean it's certainly a lot more woke now right like now mm-hmm. compared to like two or three years ago and even pre uh certainly pre me too movement and all that stuff but like still like a big chunk of the movie industry is still very much like yeah, it's no market for it. Why are we spending money on making these type of movies, you know? Yeah. Hmm. But there always is a niche for something like that. Yeah. What I found interesting is that the writer or the originator of this story, um, Hal Reed, is uh, is actually a producer for Where Are My Children, Lois Weber. Really? Yeah, and huh. so he had always kind of been supporter of these rights. And he actually took this movie. I'm just now reading the essay too. So I looked him up on Wikipedia and f- figured some of this out, but he, he, he's the father in the, in the film and his wife plays the mother of the daughter. And oh. I think I forgot if their son wasn't there, but it, it's like a family almost, movie <laughs> now willis mm. robert is uh is also the director and the actor the guy who was like basically in the you know yeah he's the husband yeah. yeah but um but yeah so that i think was pretty pretty cool story in that you know he he has a history of supporting the women's rights and suffrage movement and he took this movie to sort of the movement and actually had them critique it uh the suffrage movement and they made some changes to the movies so Hmm. even though it may have already been melodramatic they may have added an additional sort of elements to make it even more i guess i'm not so sure i I don't know i'm just reading in between the lines (laughs) yeah so that's what i think that's so cool though because i mean it would be great because a lot of people like reading 
you know, the subtext too. It's like, you know, what's really going on here? Right. So, yeah, probably right. Um, another part I thought was great about this film, just, I, I don't know, I like the newspaper ads, like, digging at her. I wrote down, the woman's party sends a mere girl to be butchered in a political arena. Slander, you know? Oh, just, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I just like the way they were writing all these fake articles to, yeah. you know, goad her. <laughs> that, was, that was just, like, a note I had. Yeah. And then, now that you mention uh, Hal's son, maybe he played Dan Channing? Yeah, possibly? he's, um... Yeah, he was also so I think so the actress Dorothy Davenport married Hal's son. I can't find the name now. I'm not remembering this, but the the uh so he's her father-in-law in real life and the mother in the movie is her mother-in-law in real life. If that makes sense. Yeah. Very interesting. So yeah. And then what else? It was like another line that he had too. I came here to report the news, not sling mud. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought it was so wait, because it is the melodrama. It like is. Like we said, you know, it's so dramatic. It's like it oh. is. And then he leaves. <laughs> he leaves the office. Yeah, it, it, I think that's that's the thing. Is uh, let's see, uh, the production was something of a. This is the essay that the San Francisco Silent Film Festival posted about this particular movie. Maybe they hand this out as you're watching the movie or something, but. Uh, the production was something of a family fair. Um, Davenport's father-in-law, Hal Reed, wrote and produced the picture and appeared on screen as Clara Madison, which is the main character that Dorothy plays. Madison's father with Mrs. Hal Reed, Bertha Westbrook, playing her mother. Five years early, Hal Reed had made Votes for Women, a two-reel suffrage film featuring activists Dr. Anna Howard Shaw and Jane Addams. He had also produced... Lois Weber's explosive birth control feature, Where Are My Children? Previous year, hmm. suggesting his willingness to engage in the nation's most polemical debates. Eager to earn endorsements from suffragists, uh, Reed screen a print of mothers of men, four suffrage leaders in the East Coast, then incorporated many of the changes they suggested. Having made the film in California, where women could already vote, he wanted the film to have a wide reach across the country. So, yeah, I mean, it goes on, the article, but they, uh, it, you know, when the 19th Amendment uh, went into effect uh, around 1921, this movie got re released as then every woman's problem. So it's just so interesting uh, mm -hmm. from the time that they initially showed it to the recut version in 1921 or re reintroduced version, whatever that term is. So, right. um, my notes on this was, if I can find a hang on a second. Uh, so, so first thing I noticed, uh, is that cause you know, I usually watch this on the larger screen. <clears throat> um, I noticed that the makeups for everyone is very theatrical. You could see some of the characters, like some of the newsmen were like powder white, like just caked, right? You could just tell, um, because the restoration is so clear, right? And if you blow this right. image up to a large screen, you could see it's like, wow, the makeup is crazy. Like, the guy's like powdery white, right? <laughs> One That's of the, interesting. Yeah, the I, didn't, I had it on my computer, so I didn't see the fine details yeah, or notice the makeup. The suffrage woman, like, one of them had really deep eye shadows. I don't know if that was, like, intentional or whatever, but it was just very pronounced, like, the, the, hmm. the, the makeup's... <clears throat> um, I also found the framing was quite interesting. Um, like the blind sister would often be in a position of power. So, so she would always be standing. If you look at mm. the frame and you put pause on the, and, and like a still frame, mm. you can see she's always in the position of power. Sometimes she'd be sitting down, but a lot of times she's standing up and sort of uh, giving comfort or kind of giving ex exposition or moving or just kind of connecting the pieces and becoming kind of a heart of the the main character, right? That Dorothy Davenport plays. Right. But she also often is also in a position of power. Even in the um, judge scene, she's always obviously uh, sat at the top and everybody would stand and stuff like that. So I feel like the framing, just like the, any a lot of these older movies are, are, I don't know if they intentionally, or maybe they intentionally do it, or maybe they subconsciously already figure this out 
from the theater days. So I thought that was cool. Um, there's a few close-ups too, especially towards the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. When, before they got married, they kind of, you could see a close-up. And um, that's kind of unusual because uh, close-ups only really, I mean, in terms of narrative movies, <laughs> not saying, trying to say first or not, but just in terms of how it's been used practically, A Birth of a Nation used it a lot in 1915, and this is only a couple of years after that, right? And people used right. it before then, too. It's just the point is that I'd like to point that out. So it's already starting to be incorporated. So it's not always yeah. static, right? It's Actually, I'm really glad that you mentioned Birth of a Nation because that was only two years before the original came out of this uh, ver- you know, uh, uh, of this film. Excuse me. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like, wow. You know, just even though I'm thinking – I'm probably only thinking because – of the restoration making it all that much more impressive in my mind you know just just thinking that they're not that far apart you know they're only two years maybe three depending on when they were truly released right or the making and editing of them but anyway i anyway, continue <laughs> yeah and um i also love the part that as the main character was struggling through sort of you know, rising career of being the judge and stuff, you could see just in terms of the movie, it really shows you that, you know, the women's right is actually just like the people's rights. It's not just the women. Like, I love the, how the movie just like, it was also the dad, right? And the sister and the mother. Like, it was her whole family. Mm-hmm. And it was also her husband, I mean, like they're men, right? The dad and the husband, and I, I love that they were involved uh, every step of the way in some ways. So first, like you know, the husband would, you know, choose not to run against, you know, the you know future fiance wife, slash wife, yeah. right? And you know, uh, and she, th- he would think the best of her to for her career to progress, and and it's certainly very progressive, right? So I thought that was cool that they showed some pieces of that elements of that it's the men that also supports the women. So it's not just like everything is done by hundred percent women, but it's, it's like a family thing. Yeah. You know, the rights, like the original, you know, suffrage movement and right. Like, you know, like it's about the whole family too. Right. So that's like one element. I think the other element I like was the dad, that the dad was also just like, how can this be? And he was like this, Mm -hmm. like boisterous and, I am. I can't. You can't hear the audio, but you can tell from the acting. It was like loud and and knowing some of the background now about how he supported that in real life, and how you also executive and produced and you know had a a stake in it. I feel like you know just the fact that he was there um, that was kind of cool. I, I just think that I mean, as a dad myself of a daughter, I'm like I would want my daughter to have everything that she want like to be. I, I wouldn't want any limits for her, right? Like. If mm-hmm. I if she wants to be a judge, then heck, she should be a judge. Like, wh- why should there be any problems with that, right? Yeah. So I think like all this stuff that's very topical and, and and kind of charged and stuff, but it's also like it's just about like a human basic right, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? What I'm trying to communicate? Yeah. No, I agree. I when you're talking about your daughter, I was just like, I hope my dad feels the same way for me. <laughs> but I think he does now that you say that, because you know, if. <sighs> You know, if you're a good parent, you want the best for your child. So, Absolutely. Yeah. You want them to possibly do better than you, if not, you know, greater. <laughs> so, I don't know. Just, it's nice hearing that because, you know, it ties into the movie. It ties into real life. And really, movies movies are life. Yeah. And, and, uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, because it is like a family, uh, I wrote down that, it has the film has great emotional structure because especially as we're drawing towards the end it's you know you you really i actually wasn't sure if they were gonna kill off the husband i figured they wouldn't (laughs) (laughs) but you know it's the music that's building up and it really pulls out the heart so i was like oh my god this is i was watching it i'm like oh my god what's gonna happen (laughs) that's that's the nature of melodrama right i know i was feeling so much i was so surprised (laughs) and that's also the power of movies right it's mm-hmm. it's supposed to help humans feel something towards some some 
some topic that they're trying to you know show you through the story you know, what's going on. It's supposed to make an impact somehow mm-hmm. and certainly i think um you know you you have very cynical people i think that would say oh it's like a propaganda right like suffrage movement propaganda yeah. yeah maybe but you know so are many many movies in the past yeah um but like in a, the other comment i wrote down was the artwork certainly like we talked about that just the intertitle artwork was one of the most amazing that i've seen very uh, up there with uh, nasratu i think was also very beautifully done very similar mm. artfully done um i found it interesting and funny that when the main character found out about her husband's fate she went back into her house and laid on the dead animal like the the yeah, bear it's <laughs> like, weird the bear skin runs, yeah runs. Like, she's so like depressed she's like ah well it's <laughs> more just like her <laughs> it, i don't know inadvertently commenting on her privileged life like she's so yeah. privileged to have one i don't have one <laughs> <laughs> i mean maybe i could buy one i guess i don't know but i i i gotta assume back then it's it was a sign of privilege. Like if you own one, it's like you, you're, you made it. <laughs> That's true. I hadn't thought of that. I just thought it was very weird. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that was what they're intending to, 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 to communicate, but it just, I just found it interesting that that's what she did. It was like, she's in a position of power now. Like she could afford this stuff. And if you watch a lot of the older black and white and silent films, that's often, a sign of like privilege or wealth or prestige mm-hmm. or or status is you have these dead animals de- decorating your house. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, that. you are right. It does make a lot of sense if you have something stuffed, like especially a bear, since it's one of the most powerful creatures you can shoot and kill within like uh, just say america you're not shooting lions or anything right so you own that you're you're tough as nails and you got wealth (laughs) yeah um another i i've while watching this film too i think i mentioned it on one of our previous podcasts i had seen the film clemency um that was with alfrey woodard uh just a bit of that was kind of flowing back to me while watching this just because, like we said, uh, what's her name? Clara Madison. She she's in a position of power, and she wants to help her husband, but she can't. And it was kind of like that with the film Clemency, because Alfrey Woodard was the head of a, a a prison. I think she was the prison warden, and she was trying to save this man's life, who was falsely accused for murder. And at the end, she just couldn't. So, I mean, obviously different endings, but it was just a lot of similarities, I think, when they were in the jail scenes. Because despite all you try to do to help somebody, you have to... Unfortunately, it's like, well... You have to uphold the law. Yeah, you have to uphold the law. Thank you. Just like, ugh. I mean, she is a judge, so... Yep. And then I'm sure you caught that comment too from the guy. Two out of one out of two out of one, she picks her husband or something like that from that guy. <laughs> it's like okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then she didn't suck on that. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I that whole sort of um, sort of conflict I thought was multi layered. I mean. You know, if you analyze it, so there's on on one track, you've got this uh, you know like rise of this amazing. I guess you've been a lawyer and eventually became the judge, and now like the superior court in a position of power, and you know became like a governor real fast. And so with her rise in power, um, she had to sort of in, in in the movie it shows a lot of just the suffrage movement backing her and was con- congratulating her and yet um i feel like it definitely introduced elements that was you know allowed her to be conflicted right you know of course like these mm-hmm. story thread of like 
the way that her husband was accused of uh, murder was like, you know, the Italians, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, the Italians. It was a very interesting <laughs> uh, way they did it. But it was like, yeah, the Italians are the villain. And they invited her husband to eat and all of a sudden uh, threw a handmade bomb into, I guess, the press, right? That's one of the. Yeah, like, and ended up killing the guy who was slandering uh, Clara Madison. Exactly. <laughs> so then it was like, and because they had some. Uh, I don't know, maybe not proof, but sort of uh, some his- history of like uh, the husband trying threatening to kill the press, right? When he confronted. That's true, because uh, we saw earlier in the film too, he was choking the guy out. <laughs> right, exactly. So there's the element of like, well, maybe there's some like evidence that this guy could be. I thought that's what they were going for, but I I don't remember that ever coming back up again. But no. So the the point is that the there's two Italian guys who one of them like you know built a homemade bomb and bombed out this the press of the the journalists the media and killed the the journalists and you know this the the judge's uh the main character's husband was present with them even though he didn't commit the crime they arrested all of them and now they're demanding you know you know blood for blood i guess you know so it's Mm -hmm. like if you know he did commit the crime he ought to you know pay for the mom mentality comes and says you know, he's got to pay pay for it with his life, you know? And then, so that's why they're, I think it, it felt like these story elements were created just so she could have this moral dilemma at the end. Like, I don't know if the mm-hmm. actual story threads had, it was very fully fleshed out in that, in some ways in a more naturalistic fashion, but it certainly was created so that she could have this co- moral conflict at the end. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. it's like it was crafted to do that, which is kind of the nature of how melodrama works too. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was like the element of, you know, A, you know, so you got, yes, you got the, you know, rise to power and you could see the happy marriage. And then B, uh, you could see her uh, sentencing this murderer who also had a mother too and other family mm-hmm. members in the court, but she was just like, the law is the law. Death penalty for you, you know. May God have your, may God have mercy on your soul. So it was some some dialogue like that, right? Mm-hmm. It was just like she still upheld uh, the law. I, was it then that she was crying? Or, yeah, was she was tearing up because I think she would. She the way they uh, did the scene was they they had the man, then they put her husband in his spot, and then it went back to him. So she was kind of seeing her husband in a sense. Exactly. She, but yeah, she it was a close up and she was crying as she was giving the order. And right. I, I th- thought it was really good too cuz you know, it's just that she you know, she feels so much pain but there's nothing she can really do about it. Right. So I'd, I'd say that's like the the secondary story that beefs up that sort of tension and also risk too and you know, what she's risking losing. And of course then, you know, the whole notion of the guy getting wrapped up in sort of these criminals and then yeah <laughs> getting all sort of accused even though and you know what i found a little disjointed a little bit was like i i didn't understand why they couldn't fight more well first there's well let's rewind a little bit you know there was a time when like um he was practicing law and he brought a case in front of her mm-hmm. in a in a as a judge i thought that was odd i because I think in real life, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I don't know for sure. But there would be like some sort of conflict of interest. You know what I mean? Actually, yeah, you're right. Because I was thinking of that a few times within this film. Because I know if you know the person there, you can't do anything. Exactly. But maybe because – but then thinking about law and order, well, the attorneys know the, the attorneys know the judges because they see them all the time. So maybe not really <laughs> yeah. dating. I don't know. <laughs> I know as a um, – this is the only sort of um, times I deal with that because I don't live a life of crime is uh, <laughs> through uh, – what do you call that? The uh, uh, jury duty, right? So when you – Yeah. I don't know if you've done that yet, but I, I've been No, called. not yet. So I've been called to it and like you participate. It's part of your civil duty, et cetera, and they explain everything to you. But one of the questions to ask you as, a, as you're participating in jury duty is do you know like the people involved in this case if you're called upon it? Yeah. If the answer is yeah, I know them. Like it's my uncle Joe. Like they're not. They don't. They don't want you to be in the jury. Yeah. Because you know the guy. You know them, right? <laughs> and so I gotta think that in the law of court, like 
if there was a, a, a district judge somewhere, you know, in your area, and then like you know that there's some sort of relationship there, that's got to be not partial. That's it's supposed to be. I mean, as much as you can, you know, as a human being, to be impartial, it's supposed to be the the the, the truth. You know, the the the, the, the what's that called the the um, justice should be blind, right? Like yeah, objective justice and truth. So uh, I I don't know if that's like in reality. <laughs> But if if your lawyers and your listeners are like, oh yeah, I could be having right, write, write, write us an email, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, so like, that's why towards the end, I just feel like, yes, there's something like there you can't pardon him, but I also felt like they didn't even the whole family didn't really like put up a fight as much. It was almost just like we're resigned to the role of like him just going to his the gallows being hung. But we're yeah. not going to fight it. We're not going to actually, like, try to, you know, use argument or some appeal to, mm-hmm. like, you know, figure out that like, he just got swept up and there's just circumstantial evidence. There's not like. Yeah, especially you know. that, you know, his wife being in, you know, knowing everything about the court of law. I mean, we have to think, too, maybe they were still writing the book on law 100 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe. maybe nothing's all matching up. But I don't know. She would know every trick in the book right. to kind of get him out of. Uh, uh, what I can't think. Uh, shoot, I can't think of what he he's supposed to be like an accessory to murder. Yeah. But obviously, because you know, where were the witnesses? There was a whole bunch of witnesses. No right. one saw this dude whip <laughs> the the bomb into the building. Yeah. I'm sure there'd be some people working there. <laughs> But anyway, so the the end of the movie is that somehow the the priests or whatever convinced finally convinced uh oh so the that's right. So the Italian guy who threw the bombs dad heard him in a dream saying that he was going to build a or or something like that that he's been dreaming about doing this. So that's like evidence enough for the priest and the priest finally was like you know I you have to, you know, tell the truth blah 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 or you know God have mercy on your soul or threaten him with something. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. I think he still God died weird. at the end, but the, you know the 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 good guy lived. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I just thought that there could have been something done there more. And I understand that, like, why they couldn't from a story perspective, because if she even lifts a finger, the press would be all over that and saying mm-hmm. she has, you know, there's a bias of the husband, blah blah blah. But also, it would also be like it's okay because I think it's like it's your husband. You should you know, love him enough to try to fight for it. Right. And yeah. I think she, at some point she wanted to resign. Right. Yeah. I, th- yeah, I, I believe she did. She figured, uh, I'm trying to think exactly. Cause I didn't write that down in my notes. Well, she wanted to resign just so she can save like, her husband. Yeah. Or something like that. A yeah, fight for him th- or something. I think the idea was that if she gave him a pardon or clemency, then she was going to resign or she would just have to resign. Right. That's something I'd want to watch it over again. Cause then now I'm kind of confused myself. Yeah. It's, it wasn't clear in the film that I remember. Um, but the other element of this, and this is, there's multi layers. So I, that's why I'm listing all these layers or right? all these things that is making her conflict on top of everything else. There are often constant images of her thinking about motherhood. So I was confused because, yeah, was she had she been pregnant all this time or not pregnant? I, it wasn't very super clear. Like had mm-hmm. had she already been pregnant and she told him, and so now they're expecting. And if he dies, he would be leaving her and the child, right? Yeah. Because that would amp up the drama. Or is it just she's she's dreaming about it? She's projecting this future future history that if she loses him. Uh, she wouldn't have this uh, imaginary family with the kid and stuff, you know. I I, I mm. wasn't hundred percent sure where that story element was. So either she's imagining a future uh, that is uh, at risk of being lost by his death, right? Mm-hmm. Or that she's already pregnant and that she would. Yeah. I wasn't too totally clear. I mean, I just assumed 
when you know they had the scene where she's knitting i'm just and then he's like oh what you got there honey (laughs) and and, you know or at least after marriage because i mean everyone just hopes that you get pregnant once you're married (laughs) otherwise whoops (laughs) so that's the way i thought of it yeah It, it just wasn't super clear what the whole context was so so i don't know but at the end at the end of the movie they you know he got out everything's fine I thought that the shot of the crowd and mob was really wonderfully done because e- even now it's hard to have a mob of people and control them and just, you know, it it all seems so natural of like people just going out on the streets, sort of chasing after things in cars. I don't know. Yeah. Actually, yeah, you're right now that you mentioned that, too. I I love you bringing all these things up because it's like, oh, yeah, another point. Because, you know, you think with background today, everyone's got out their smartphones and blah, blah, and they don't want to pay attention. I think because maybe film was so new back then, they wanted to do a good job. Or they're probably just like, hey, go nuts. <laughs> I don't know. It really could be either or. Well, there's a more element of uh, naturalness to the crowd scenes, I feel like, with the earlier, these type of movies. Because they hadn't had a lot of background and extras experiences. True. At this point, I would say maybe just uh, 10 years, a decade or more of background, large mob scenes, I would say. You know, it's just starting out. And so... I think people are still trying to figure out how to use those effectively. It just felt like it felt more natural of the crowd mobbing around cars, pushing things. It just felt it felt more like that. But also there was a, certainly a, at the end when they were driving him out of the courthouse and he was freed and she was arriving at the other car. It's it's very cinematic in some ways. Yeah. It's almost like a modern movie of like the movie score swells and they hug and kiss and that's the end of the movie. You yep. know what I mean? <laughs> like that's that would be like a typical shot of like a the, the, the modern, mm-hmm. more sentimental, I guess, less cynical. In fact, we probably don't see a lot of those movies today because so yeah. many movies today are so dark and cynical. <laughs> Nobody wants to shoot like that. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the only one I can think of off the top of my head is Grease in a sense. <laughs> right. Yeah, something <laughs> when similar they fly in their car. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... I mean, at the very end, they had this uh, scene. It concludes with, um, you know, she has the kid and he's free and all three of them are on top of this rock arch, which is shot in uh, what's called natural bridges. It's a, uh, it's eroded. It no longer exists. So it's in oh, wow. many, many places in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, very local to that area, uh, Cooper Street Courthouse, Holy Cross Church, Piedmont House, Chinatown, and those rock arches and natural bridges are gone. So, anyways, a lot of uh, Berkeley's uh, Shatuck Avenue. I don't know how you pronounce it. Maybe they have a different pronunciation over there. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, I I thought it was a well done movie in terms of technical direction, the director, and well acted. Um, Dorothy Davenport is a, I, I don't know too much about her, but I, I just know from Wikipedia that she, uh, both her parents are actors, actress in the arts, and she came from a long line of them. So this is kind hmm. of her, you know, trade, I guess. Yeah. Her calling family in craft. Sense. Yeah. Just continuing kind of what the family's been doing. Um, and she, she is married to, uh, Hal Reed's son, can't find the name here now but he certainly what happened was he was shooting a movie a few years after this um first they had a son i think after this in real life and then because at that point she wasn't uh a mother yet and then after that uh his husband then uh got injured in some train accident for special effects or something in a movie shoot and then his doctors to start prescribing some um painkillers and he got addicted to it and he died as a result of his addiction to it a few years later so by 1921 or 22 23 i think he already died and after that she made a movie about heroin addiction or something like that (laughs) so huh that's that's sad it is sad (laughs) yeah and since then she's made a lot of movies so i i don't know all the details i don't know if they're all restored or a lot of them are lost this movie was 
thought loss too until it was discovered in uh British Film Institute in 1997 and then they uh brought it over uh and then tried to uh I guess restore it in um some uh, in uh American Zotrop which is a uh, Francis Coppola's company mm-hmm. and it just got restored uh recently 2016 the music's by um Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra which is it seems to be uh, a uh, another common sort of artist that would often uh, score silent films. So it's like a it's cool. Mm, very they have um, albums you can get too. If you check out, um, I'll try to link this if I remember <laughs> later on. Note to myself: link link this uh, Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra. So they've come out with uh, CD albums of the silent film music and stuff like that. So. Ooh, that'd be nice to just listen to yeah, without yeah. watching films. <laughs> yeah, some of these are I I don't I didn't do re- research into this. I don't know for sure, but I I'm thinking they're new music hmm. that they're uh, writing for these movies because remember a lot of these movies didn't have uh, originally, you know. Uh, uh commission scores right so they don't always have written scores for these because uh it would be up to the local musician of the local theater to try to improvise um often more often than not sometimes they come with some scores but not always and if they did they might not always be retained might be lost to history and time but anyways that's the artist um Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra that did the music. So any uh, other parting thoughts? Um, I don't know. Not for this film. I mean, after watching it, I'm curious to know if there are any other known uh, Willis Robarts pictures out there, or at least I I'd did like look. To see... It's what do you uh, think? I'm not, not sure. It's I remember so many things are lost, and so. Right. Yeah, just thinking of what what might exist, or at least something with Dorothy Davenport. Cause I I thought she was, I I liked her style of acting. I mean, it was you know being a melodrama anyway. She seemed the I don't know more more natural, right? In some respects, so I'm curious to see her in another film, whatever it might be. Yeah, I'm sure I'll uh, uh, come back up again think but um oh i did have one note do you think the sister was really blind i kept trying to figure that out oh in real life i don't know yeah yeah i don't know (laughs) i would i don't know i just feel like i see i don't know she was always just looking at the corner and i i don't know i'm probably going down kind of a good technique if you think about it yeah that's true yeah oh well (laughs) that's a common technique though i would say yeah because I, I don't know, I'm just I'm a, I'm a jerk. I was watching it when they were at the dinner table. I was kind of watching her eyes to see if they moved at all. <laughs> but she was at such a kind of harsh angle, you couldn't tell. Yeah, you're trying to figure out how they act, they did they did the acting, right? So yeah, because I know with films now, it they the industry kind of tries to stay away from people with certain disabilities because how can you teach? I, I mean, ugh, this is kind of going down a rabbit hole too with you know with blind people or deaf people but like with uh oh geez the the movie that just came out uh a a quiet place that's the movie they used a real deaf actress in it right but i don't know how you do it with blind people but anyway that that i don't want to i'm still i'm done (laughs) i don't want to no i mean i I understand what you're trying to say i mean uh you know it, movies would be more authentic if you use the actual person with the actual disability in the mm-hmm. movies and not just uh, a person who doesn't have the disability and act as disability. Yeah. So it, there's definitely points to make for that. But also you have the other flip side of the coin, which is always like the people saying, you know, that's the, kind of the point of acting is to, to become something else. But like, yeah. it, But if you were disabled, let's say you couldn't see, you couldn't act like you could see. <laughs> right. That's mm-hmm. just not possible. I'm not laughing at the 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 blind people. I'm just laughing at the notion that you know though they can't do the other like they can't 
act the other way, you know? And so, but in terms of the portrayal of the actual movie, you want to be authentic. Like that's there. That's a, again, that's a whole nother sort of uh ball of wax. Sort of story. <laughs> yeah. But William L. Uh, Robart's been in a number of things. Um, but he did die in 1921. At some point, he's he was fairly, I mean, not old, but older by then, I think, when he made this movie. But he was in uh, The Three Musketeers. I think that's the big one after that with um, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Mm-hmm. I think. Oh, no, maybe this is a different. This is different. This story, no, this might be a different one. There's so many adaptations of it, so I'm not entirely. Yeah, this is a different adaptation of it. Wow, well, I didn't know there were several. Anyways, so that's him. Um, so he didn't really do much. He 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 did direct a lot of short movies before this movie. But this is, I think, his only feature, full length feature that he directed. Hmm. Interesting. And I think she went on to have a fairly long career um, as an actress. A lot of shorts in the 1910s. But afterwards, she started making a lot of her own movies and she had her own company. So just like Alice Guy and all those people, she made a career out of things. So Hmm. that's pretty cool. Very cool indeed. Cool beans. So, do you have any other other parting thoughts? Uh, no. I think uh, my only thought is I'm definitely going to send the San Francisco Film Festival an email to kind of just discuss more about this film and see what we can dig up about it. And sure. hopefully I'll have an answer by next week. Yeah, you should write, like, it's a pandemic. You should you shouldn't be busy, right? Yeah, for real. <laughs> so <laughs> that's funny. You You're real. Answer this <laughs> <true>. immediately. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, um, that's all I have for this week as well. Um, I don't know what we're gonna watch next week yet, but we'll figure out along the way. And uh, I think that's gonna wrap it up for now. So we'll chat again next week. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. You can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. That has a link to all the different platforms uh, that we're pushing out this podcast. Please leave a comment uh, at the Apple Podcast so that other film lovers can find us. We greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions, thoughts, or comments, please email us at watchingsilentfilmsplural at gmail. Again, that's watching silent films at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. We're signing off. Bye bye.